Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm going to, to try to make some bizarre connection between Darcy problem and uh, crowd motion. That may sound a bit exotic, but I would like to convince you that, that there are at least uh, formally a uh, strong connection between these two uh, areas. So I would like to start with some uh, general uh, generalities about uh, Darcy equations. So let me start with a Poiseuil. a flow that describes the flow in a pipe. When you have a pipe, it might have a circular uh, section or even a quite general section. You have your pressure, P out. And uh, if you have a viscous fluid that obeys Stokes equation in this pipe, then you have a relation, linear relation between the pressure drop and the flux that is usually written P in minus P out equals to R, that is the hydraulic resistance of the pipe, times the flux. This is the... And the Darcy equation can be seen as some kind of uh, generalization, multidimensional degeneralization of this. Uh, it can be actually be proven quite easily that if you have a network, Cartesian network of those pipes, if I zoom here, I have a pipe with, that is connected with others. So you can connect at each bifurcation point's uh, pressure, and you have fluxes going through the pipes. And if you write this Poiseuil uh, flow for each of those pipes, then you have something that is exactly the finite difference discretization of uh, equation that are the Darcy equations. It can be written U plus K gradient P equals to. So U will be actually some kind of a flux per unit area. So it's called the Darcy velocity. So it is a velocity, it's homogeneous to a velocity, but actually it represents uh, a flux per unit area. Actually, in many flows, there is no point at which the real velocity of the fluid is actually the Darcy velocity. It's some kind of average uh, velocity. And uh, so here you, you are going to write uh, some a force balance, actually, for your fluid. So typically you have gravity or some kind of body force that you write here. Um, and the body force, since my equation is homogeneous to a velocity, I'm going to write it as a velocity because it will be uh, natural in the crowd motion context. So U actually, capital U, represents some kind of a force. It could be the gravity, for example, if you have a system that is immediate to gravity and the first test realized by Darcy a long time ago were based on this kind of uh, forcing term. And uh, you have, you just write, since your fluid is incompressible, so to express uh, mass conservation, you simply write that the divergence of u equals to zero. So to simplify, I'm going to take k equal one, k is called the permeability. That is a notion that won't have any natural counterpart in the crowd motion problem. So let me uh, take it equal to one. And we have the Darcy, uh, Darcy equation. And of course, it's not limited to uh, Cartesian networks of pipes, but it also uh, it was actually intended to represent the motion of a fluid uh, that is at a very low uh, Reynolds number, meaning that it obeys locally Stokes equation. And uh, the, the typical situation that was used by Darcy, the, the picture is quite difficult to do because if you have a grains, rigid grains in 2D, you don't have space between the grains. So there can be any Darcy flow, but you have to imagine this situation in 3D. So in this case, you have, of course, always that are called pores, uh, meaning ways around uh, grains so that the fluid can go through. And uh, these equations are typically adapted to this kind of situation. Let's, let me represent some kind of 3D uh, situation. <laughs> you have a fluid going through, and this is valid at uh, some kind of meso scale, the, what is called the local velocity. It is the velocity at a point where you have a huge number of those grains 
Darcy equation are not set at the scale of grains, of course. At the scale of the grains, around grains, you have a fluid that obeys Stokes equation. And there are many works <coughs> that are based on, that show that you can go, you have a um, asymptotic expansion, you have a real uh, limit in the mathematical sense from the Stokes equation in a very complicated geometry toward the Darcy equation. Uh, it can be interpreted, and that will be important for the following, as a minimization problem. It can be uh, shown quite easily that uh, U is actually the uh, minimizer of L2 of omega. Let me consider some uh, domain uh, omega. So this is the saddle point formulation or the mixed formulation of minimization problem that is find the velocity field L2 if I am in, in dimension D of space. This is a velocity field. So the, uh, you want to find the velocity field that is the closest to you among all those vector fields that are divergence free. Let me write it properly. V in L2 of omega D such that the divergence of V equals to zero. So actually it does not make such obvious sense since I have, uh, I have fields that are in L2, so this is not defined as a function, so let me write it more properly in a dual way. V in L2 omega D such that V dot the gradient of Q equals to zero for all test function Q that will be called pressures H10 of omega. So this expresses in a weak sense that the divergence is uh, zero. And uh, it can also be written, that is quite uh, directly equivalent, the kernel of uh, some operator B, that is the divergence operator, or minus the divergence, that sense V in L2 of omega D, divergence of V, considered as an element that is in the dual space of H10, that is H minus 1 of omega. I will come back to more uh, uh, concrete uh, things, but I, I will need this kind of a little functional analysis uh, later. So the divergence of V is defined by this formulation as a linear functional over this space, that is H minus 1 of omega. And it can be written, actually, that's the, the problem is well posed because this operator, it can be checked that it has a closed range, it is actually subjective, and it's a direct consequence of the Poincaré inequality. I'm not going to do it, but it, it can be done in a few, uh, in a few seconds. Okay, so um, this is a, a general presentation of the Darcy equation. I would like to, well, let me finish just by the, the link with the Poisson uh, problem. Uh, you can, of course, eliminate, if you have this equation with k equals 1, you can eliminate the velocity to obtain an equation on the sole pressure P by simply writing U equals capital U minus gradient P, and you end up with uh, this Poisson problem minus the divergence of U. <laughs> Okay, so a quite standard uh, equation that you can uh, supplement with uh, any uh, boundary condition you, you want. Boundary condition that can be Dirichlet or Neumann. And the Dirichlet boundary condition, that's some kind of counterintuitive uh, things concerning uh, condition. When you are in a fluid context, when you talk about Dirichlet, uh, boundary condition for Stokes problems, for example, you think about the velocity, meaning that you have a wall, and the velocity, the fluid sticks to the wall. Here it's the contrary. The boundary condition applies to the pressure, the Dirichlet boundary condition applies to the pressure, meaning that the pressure is prescribed and it typically uh, corresponds to a free boundary problem. Let me uh, give you a, an example, typical example of a Darcy flow. Here you have a porous medium like sand, a matrix of uh, rigid spheres, and here, say, you have water, 
Do I have blue? Yeah. Okay, so here you have the some uh, pressure that is close to the hydrostatic pressure. And here let me consider that I have impervious boundary condition, impermeable boundary condition. And here let me imagine that I have a, uh, air. So here I will have a hydrostatic pressure. Here I will have, uh, say, zero or atmospheric pressure. You can. Uh, you can subtract the atmospheric pressure everywhere. And here, if you have impervious boundary condition, meaning that you have uh, the fluid do, does not go through the wall, here you will have dp, you have u dot n equals zero, but since u is the minus gradient p, this is dp over dn equals zero. So when you have a wall, you have Neumann condition, and when you have a free outlet here, the fluid can go freely out, then you have Dirichlet boundary condition, not the velocity, of course, but on the pressure. OK, we are still quite remote from uh, ground motion. And I would like to obtain similar equations in the ground motion context. And I will start in the microscopic Modeling, that is a work that we did, that was the PhD thesis of Julia Vanella. I'm not going into the details, but I'm going to present you the connection between this model and the Darcy problem. The problem was actually quite simple. You can see that, that the crowd, that could be you, in the, I don't know, there are 30 persons perhaps, you, are, you just represent the centers of, of mass. You, identify people with 2D uh, rigid disks, and the QI is the location of the ith center. So Q1, Q2, Qn, so you have n persons. Okay, and you want to describe the motion, you want to, uh, in some situation, for example, evacuation of a room, uh, to compute the trajectory of the whole, uh, the whole uh, crowd. <clears throat> okay, so you have a set of feasible configuration. You do not admit, you consider that people are rigid in something that is a rough approximation of the reality, but you, you do not authorize disks to overlap. Okay, so this is, this is forbidden. So it can simply be written if you consider that the disks have the same radius, the set of Q in R2N, such that Dij, that is a function that depends on Q, but actually it only depends on QI and QJ. QJ minus QI minus 2R, where R is the radius, the common radius of the, the persons. So this has to remain non-negative, okay? And you do not want to exit this uh, set, okay? Uh, what is natural for that is uh, associated to this set is to define a set of feasible velocity. That are the velocity that are authorized. So if you have uh, considered QT a trajectory, and if you consider Dij of QT, <coughs> If you make an asymptotic expansion at some time t and a uh, small time epsilon, you have dij of qt plus epsilon equals to dij of q of t plus epsilon. The gradient of dij with respect to q, of course, even if it only depends on qi and qj, times dot q of t. So this is the velocity, the actual velocity of the, of the crowd. So if at some time you have a dij of q that is zero, meaning that you have contact, you want uh, the distance to remain non-negative, so you really need this, the first order expansion, 
this to be uh, non-negative. So it leads to a natural definition of the set of feasible velocities that is written. It's a, a set of velocities that depend on the conf configuration you are at. And it can be written as a B, so I'm still, I am in some way in the tangent space of my configuration, but since the structure is Euclidean, I have the same space, of course. Um, such that this quantity is non-negative. I can write this gij times v is larger than zero, where gij is the gradient of dij. So let me try to illustrate that. If I have two particles, i and j, and here is eij, that is the unit vector uh, from i to j, and this is minus eij. This vector, if you want to write the gradient of the distance between i and j as a function, well, in the space of all degrees of freedom, this is a vector in R2n, and here you have the two components that correspond to the first particle, then the second particle. So here you have the ith particles, and here the j's particles. And here, if you see how does the distance between i and j depends when you move i, obviously it increases at the rate 1 when you move along minus eij. So this is minus eij, and this is plus eij. Just to show you that it's something that is quite easy to, to compute. Okay, so if you have a variation, if you have a configuration, and then you move it, you have a small displacement of all the configuration, and you want to see, okay, how did the distance dij move? You just make the dot product between this vector and your, your uh, displacement. Okay, and you will have the, the estimate of your uh, variation of uh, dij. Okay, so now the model is quite simple. You can see that, consider that you have a desired velocity. That is uh, the basic ingredient when you deal with crowd motion, meaning that you have people, they want to do something. Uh, if you consider it individual, it's is it reasonable to consider that there is a velocity associated to each individual that corresponds to what he or she would do if he or she would be alone? That is called the desired velocity. And you can imagine that you have a desired velocity for everybody. Usually in the example I'm going to show at the end, I will consider that the desired velocity does only depend on the position. So in some way, people are interchangeable. The velocity, it's the same. Of course, it, it depends because people at some instant, they are at different positions. But the way the velocity depends on the position will be considered as uh, uniform, meaning that if I'm here, if I want to exit the room, if I am here, I know that the table is here, I will go in this direction to try to optimize my path out of the room. But if you were at my place or anybody, he would do the same, okay? But it, it's not a very important uh, assumption for the microscopic model. So you are given this uh, desired velocity, and uh, of course, uh, things get interesting when this desired velocity is not feasible, meaning that if you apply this field to your systems, you have a first order ODE, dq over dt equal u, that depends actually on, on q. If you do that, then it will lead to overlapping. So the solution to that, it's easy to, to compute and to define, to properly define, but it's not feasible because you will violate the constraint. So the idea, the basic, is to how to account congestion in order to the constraint to be realized. And the uh, simplest way to do that is to consider that the actual velocity that is a small u will be the closest velocity, the velocity that is the closest to the desired velocity among all those velocities that are feasible. So it's simply the projection of the desired velocity u 
um, on the set of feasible velocities. Okay, so this is the, the evolution model, and this u corresponds to dq over dt. So we have an explicit, this is a model, this is a deterministic, because this CQ of Q, so it depends on the position at some instant, and CQ is a set that is defined with this, the dependence upon Q is hidden in the GIJ, that is the gradient that of course depends on the position. So this set depends on, on Q, obviously, and, uh, but it has a very nice, uh, it has nice properties. This is obviously, this is an intersection of house spaces. So this is, this is a closed convex uh, polyhedron. And uh, so the production is obviously well defined. So this defines a new velocity and you can apply it. So it looks quite uh, easy. It actually, it's not so easy to define it properly. Uh, this is not my topic today, but this was the part of the thesis of Juliette Venel to, to properly define a solution to show that there is uniqueness. Why is it not so simple? This is because the dependence of CK of Q, this set of feasible velocities, is um, uh, highly non-smooth. Okay, you can imagine when you have a, when you have two people that want to exit a room, as far as they do not touch, they can do anything. So each of them will follow its uh, desired velocity going through, and then suddenly they will touch. Okay, so imagine that this wants to go this one, wants to go in this direction. This is not no longer allowed. Okay, and then you will have to project the desired velocity onto the cone of uh, feasible velocities. And obviously, this kind of velocity, for example, this is forbidden, and the desired velocity that I represented is also forbidden. So the projection will be non-trivial, and, and it changed suddenly. So obviously, the dependence of this upon Q is highly non-smooth, so it's not even continuous. So, you, of course, you cannot use uh, Cauchy-Lipschitz uh, uh, theory, and you have to use uh, different arguments in uh, convex analysis. So I'm not going to go into the details of the, the theory of this problem, but I would like to, to uh, um, exhibit some kind of Darcy uh, problem out of this. So this is related to the mixed formulation of my minimization problem. So u, the actual velocity, let me remind you, that is defined as the minimizers of this functional. So where this is the standard Euclidean uh, norm. And I can write this j of, of phi. OK, and k? is the set of V, I'm going to write it in a matrix form, set of V such that BV, it's standard in this context to write inequality constraint by the less than, more than, greater than. So B will be a matrix, each row of which represent a constraint, meaning a, a potential constraint, meaning a couple of, of people. So th this matrix B will have this structure, actually it is um, it is quite uh, in this direction. Each line of B, if you have three people, for example, you have uh, three possible constraints, that is constraint between one and two, one and three, and two and three. Then you will have three rows. And the row of B represents the constraint that if, the, if they are, if, for example, one in this situation, you have one, two, three. The first line will represent the constraint that the velocity of one and two must verify in some kind of relation such that this distance does not decrease in a strict sense. So here you will have this, uh, uh, this vector, the dot product with the actual velocity. So here you will have uh, g, one, two. And actually, if you want to write it with the minimal sign, you will write minus uh, uh, g12, minus g13, minus g23. And if you have uh, n particles, then you have n 
n minus 1 over 2. That is the number of, of uh, pairs or couples between uh, among all individuals that express all the constraints. Actually, at some instant, you will have only the lines that correspond to an actual contact because the um, sorry, I have I made a mistake here that was implicit in my mind, but this has to be this has to be verified only when there is contact. So you need to write dij equals zero, then you have a constraint. If you do not have contact, there is no constraint on the velocity. Sorry uh, to have missed that. So at some a point, you will have contacts between particles, and from each of those contacts, you have a constraint, and you write it in a matrix way in order to get, to get this. So you have a, a quite general problem that consists in minimizing uh, functional, that is here a quadratic, but let's forget it for the, the time being, uh, submit it to some uh, inequality constraints. So let me, this is very basic uh, convex analysis, but in case some of you are not familiar with that, I'm going just to go for a, a few minutes in, in the detail to show how you can build a dual formulation of that. So you have, if you write the optimality u, the fact that u is well defined as the minimizer is not a problem. The functional is quadratic, it has nice properties, and k is closed and convex. So there exists, there exists a unique minimizer. Now, let's try to characterize it. As usually, you write that this has to be verified for each t and v, where t is real and v is a vector, such that u plus tv is in k. Uh, in, sorry, uh, I've, I made a confusion between k, the primal, and, and the velocity space, so this is, sorry, ck of q. Excuse me. Here? Yeah, you, have, you are in 2D uh, for crowd motion. That could be in 1D, actually, and I, I will make some. Uh, so you have two degrees of freedom per, per person. Uh, sorry, I made a, uh, a confusion with the notation. K represents the primal space. OK, the set of configuration, and C corresponds to velocity. So I uh, made the confusion here, and here it was also. <coughs> and here again is CK of Q, sorry. <coughs> OK, so how to get information out of that? Uh, well, you know uh, one thing for sure, that if you take V, you, you have to, to have uh, B applied to that. Less than uh, than zero. So if you take um, v such that b v is less than zero and t is uh, positive, then you are sure that you are in the right uh, set. So let me try to use the same board. So as a consequence, uh, if you make a first order expansion, you get u plus uh, t gradient g times uh, v plus something that is negligible with respect to t and g of uh, u. <coughs> this has to be valid for any t that is a positive, but as, as small as you want. So obviously, it necessitates that uh, gradient j dot v is uh, positive. OK, so what you have is that for any v that is in uh, ck of q, you have a gradient, uh, a dot product that is uh, non-negative. So you have that minus gradient j is in something that has a non-negative uh, scalar product with any element of CK of Q. Sorry, if I put a minus, I have something that has a non-positive dot product with any element of CK of Q. And this is called, with a notation, that is the polar cone, that is the set of W such that W dot V is less than zero for all v in ck of q. 
Okay. Um, let me use that one. So the, the picture you can have in mind is here you have a cone, a convex cone that is CK of Q. And the set that I consider here, that is the polar cone to this, all the vectors that have a non-negative, non-positive, sorry, dot product with elements, it looks like that. In, in 2D that you have the, this uh, situation. Okay, and now you are going to use a theorem that is standard in convex analysis. And for those who have fresh memories in functional analysis, let me just make a remark. You have something that is called, I think, the Lem de Noyau in Brez's uh, book. That is the, the following, if you have linear in, it's a very general, it can be in balance space, phi 1, phi n, and another phi. If you have the intersection of the kernels of phi that are e, the kernel of phi, then you have that phi is a linear combination of the phi i. It uses Han Barnard's theorem. And you have some kind of unilateral version of that that is called, and that will, we are almost done with a, a abstract uh, convex analysis story for those who are allergic to this kind of thing. Here, uh, the Farkas lemma, it tells you that if you have CK of Q, that is the set of V such that dig equals zero implies gij dot v is larger than zero. If you have a cone that is written like that as the intersection of half spaces, then ck of q polar, you have a, an explicit expression of that. That is the some kind of linear uh, sign, linear combination of, of the gij. Uh, so you have uh, the lambda ij are non-negative, and uh, dij lambda ij is equal to zero, meaning that if dij is not zero, that lambda ij has to be zero. So it gives you an explicit expression of the polar cone. So to what it tells you, if I want to come back to my optimization problem, it tells you that uh, minus gradient of j of your functional can be written like that. Okay. So now this expression is correspond actually with my, if I come back to my matrix B, which I erased unfortunately, but the matrix B that expressed the constraint, actually this corresponds to a linear combination of the jij. So this is something that can be written uh, B uh, star the transpose matrix applied to lambda. Let me write, perhaps use a, uh, a different notation for pressure or Lagrange multiplier. We'll use, since they will correspond to pressure, I will use a pressure terms. So this corresponds to B star uh, Q. Uh, one row of uh, uh, B was expressing the constraint. It contained the GIJ, that is the gradient of the distance. And now I have a column that corresponds to the same vector. And what it gives you is the something that has quite uh, standard form. That is the grade. Yeah? Oh, sorry. That's why I just, no. Let, let me stick to lambda. Yes, you are right. It's so I, I will use a, a notation like that later. Sorry, you are right. Let me stick to lambda for the Lagrange multiplier that will corresponds to pressure. Okay. Uh, that I knew there was a reason for <laughs> that not to use Q, but I had forgotten. Uh, B star lambda. So I have. Uh, I, I can write that minus the gradient of J is equal to uh, something like that. So I have the gradient of j plus b star <coughs> lambda that is equals to zero, and I have b u 
equals to zero. So I have optimality, necessary optimality condition that can be written like that. So it's still a bit far from a Darcy problem that I would like to, to show you. What? Yeah? In the GI. Yeah. yeah. If you have, for example, two particles that are in contact, so you have uh, f the number, the degrees of freedom is four, and uh, if you are in this configuration, if you have one and two particles, if you have EIJ, uh, E12 and minus E12, GIJ is a 4D vector that contains first the gradient of the distance with respect to the position of, of one, that is minus E1, so this is two component, and then E12. And of course, if you move, so if you just translate, it won't change. But of course, if you rotate, it will change the direction. So the dependence, it's on the GIG. Yeah, that's right. So if you have, let, let me remind you that this functional was written like that. So uh, the gradient of, of J is simply at U is simply U minus capital U. So this writes U plus B star lambda equals zero and B U, sorry, it's not equals zero, but it's less than zero, meaning that this is a vector, each component of which has to be non-positive. Okay, and I have something that looks, at least formally, of course, it's the, the shape of any uh, a saddle point problem, but it's, it goes a bit farther that, than uh, this uh, abstract formulation. Let me consider, for example, uh, the 1D situation when you have particles in a row. So you have n particles. So in that case, matrix B that expresses the first line corresponds to minus the gradient of the distance between 1 and 2 with respect to all degrees of freedoms. So of course it only depends on the first two ones. And um, it's one and minus two. It would be minus one and, and one if you consider the gij, but I have a minus sign. And, and you have a matrix that is like that. Okay, so, and you have of course the, it's transpose, one minus one, one, minus one, etc. So you see that, at least in, in one day, the analogy is, is obvious. This looks up to multiplicative constant as a differenti differentiation operator. This is a gradient in, in one day, actually, if you have here. It's, for example, for the, the second particle, here if you have some boundary effects. But for this distance, for example, you have the, this velocity minus the previous one, it differentiates, well, not velocity, sorry, it corresponds to pressure. Uh, you, you make a difference between, uh, between pressures, so it corresponds to a, a, a differential operator of the first order. So just for the 1D, so it's not very satisfying, but it can be uh, shown, and actually that will be a bit complicated to make pictures, but I will show you on the computer that there is more than a, a this, uh, analogy in formal analogy or analogy in 1D. Let me just say that you have some kind of underlying Poisson problem and that is interesting to express it. What is the underlying, is there a Laplace operator, underlying Laplace operator? That's not so obvious, but if you consider this uh, problem, and actually I will consider when I am in a situation, so I know that there is a lambda, I did, it's not a real proof, but you can show that there will exist a lambda. I will talk about its uh, un possible uniqueness, such that this is true. But now you can consider, there is also something that is called a complementary slackness condition, that is that uh, lambda dot product with BU equals to zero. It means that uh, when you have uh, a constraint that is not saturated, meaning that B U, the some element of, of B U is uh, strictly negative, then the corresponding lambda has to be uh, zero. 
And um, so if you are in this situation, if you consider only uh, active constraint, meaning that for you have constraints, some of them are active, meaning that the, um, you have a gij times uh, dot product with u equals to the or this is an active constraint, then you keep only the active constraint and you forget the other anyway, uh, there, there won't be any uh, lambda associated. It will not uh, change anything if you consider active constraints, so that here you have zero and you have up to a, a, a chain of, uh, of your space of Lagrange multiplier. You get rid of those that are not useful and you end up with that. And here you can, as in the Darcy problem, you can eliminate the velocity to obtain something that is B, B star U equals to B uh, capital U, sorry, I forgot, uh, capital U here. And I will sh show you again in the actual computation that this behaves like a bit like a Laplace operator. Let me just say one thing about that, the fact that actually all the complexity of microscopic uh, crowd motion models or it's the same for granular flows comes from the fact that this is actually a very bad Laplace operator. It has very bad properties. For example, uh, it is not necessarily, you know that in, in the continuous level for the Darcy problem, if you put Dirichlet boundary condition, for example, you have a unique solution. Here, it's not the case. You can show that there are degenerate solutions that may appear in practice and that have, it has uh, strong consequences on the models. The, the smallest, the simplest uh, configuration for which there is non-uniqueness is the following. Well, actually, I was not able to find a, a simpler one. Here you have 14 uh, people or grains, and you can show that you can you just count that uh, if you have 14, then you have um, 28 degrees of freedom, and if you count the active contacts in the particle, if I'm not mistaken, you have 28 contacts. Okay, so it means that matrix B is rectangular. And, uh, and this is 28, and this is 29. Okay, so uh, you have a matrix B, B star, your discrete Laplace operator that is, has uh, order 29, but it cannot have rank 29, okay? Because of, of this, so it has, the, its rank is at most 28. So there is a, um, a degenerate mode that corresponds to the kernel of, uh, of this matrix. And it has important consequences. It means that as soon as it has some kind of funny consequence, as soon as you have 14 people in the metro, for example, crushed, it means that there is no uniqueness in the Lagrange multiplier, meaning that it can be very, very unstable. You, can have, you cannot determine the pressure between people from the outside, even if you know uh, what, what all the people want to do if they push in, in one direction. You are not, there is a uh, uh, non-uniqueness in the Lagrange multiply. Okay, so... Uh, no, it's not, it's not, uh, it's a real, I actually I computed it once in this situation. It's some kind of uh, rotating mode, meaning you can find uh, <coughs> Lagrange multiplier, you can, you can find Lagrange multiplier, for that you have to admit that can be positive or negative, but such that if you apply this to, uh, meaning if here you have a Lagrange multiplier at a contact, then you apply a force that is this Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the, the gradient. So you have a complicated construction to do, but what, what is expressed here is that there exists a set of Lagrange multiplier that if you do that, the resultant force on the system is zero, although the Lagrange multiplier are not zero. Okay? And it cannot be obtained with positive Lagrange multiplier, but if you accept negative, uh, you see that this particle, it can be, well, it's not so obvious, but, uh, but you can find some, such a mode. Okay. Um, Okay, let me say perhaps a few words on uh, microsc macroscopic problem. It's actually, if you do not enter into details, it's ma a bit simpler. So let me 
take a few minutes to talk about that, and then I will try to illustrate those considerations I realized when I... This is the first time I try to structure the presentation that I realize I'm aware that it's not so, perhaps, so obvious to understand what it's all about. But I hope that you uh, got uh, the idea that what, what you get, the abstract, the discrete problem you get is actually in 1D. That's true. It's really something that is uh, direct, like a uh, finite difference uh, discretization of your Darcy problem. This is directly that. In more complicated situation, it's a bit... Sorry, I made another uh, mistake here. It's, of course, uh, uh, Bose and, and Lambda. And you get something that is close to... A, I will try to show you in an illustration. That is close to a Laplace problem. Let me just perhaps end with the, by saying that uh, when you have a configuration, you have two graphs that are naturally associated to this configuration. You have contact. That is the primal graph associated to the primal degrees of freedom that are the centers of the particles at which velocities are defined. This is the primal graph. But the lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, that corresponds to pressure between particles, they are associated to those contact points. So what I call this, this bizarre Laplace operator that comes from the Darcy problem is actually something that is defined on the green set, and the connectivity of this set is, is also bizarre because it connects all the points, the context points that share a grain. So the structure would be like that, and you get an awful graph that suggests the, the complexity, actually, uh, of the the underlying operator. So, well, the picture anyway is not very uh, illustrative. So actually what, what I call this Laplace operator, it lives on, on this graph, the dual graph, the green graph in my uh, figure. <coughs> okay, let me say a few words on uh, macroscopic, and I will get something that is closer to the Darcy problem in the usual sense, actually. The macroscopic version of this uh, model that I wrote here, I lost it. Let me remind you the microscopic model. It was, you define uh, dq over dt equals to u, and u is defined as the projection onto ck of q of the desired velocity, capital U. And that's it. Whereas the ck of q is defined as uh, uh, no, it's no longer written, but it was a set of velocities such that gij, when I have contact, dij equals zero, then I must have gij dot v that is larger than zero. Okay, for the macroscopic, it's actually easy to write. You have a uh, crowd that is described by a density that depends on uh, space and time. And you have a transport equation. So this actually notation is, uh, is replaced by a transport of the density by the actual velocity field. And this is replaced by, well, first, the notion of desired velocity is kept. We still have a desired velocity that depends on the location of uh, on the time. Okay. For example, for evacuation of a room, it corresponds to velocities. You go uh, straight ahead to, the, to the, the exit, if you want to exit the room. And uh, the actual velocity, it's quite tempting to define in the very same way the projection onto some kind of cone I'm going to detail that depends now on the density rho, and no, there is no Q anymore, the density rho of the desired velocity. And uh, what, is the, what is the cone of feasible velocity, the velocity that are allowed, le or let me write that I want to keep a constraint, so the counterpart of my discrete K that corresponds to disks that do not overlap are the set of densities such that uh, they remain below a certain threshold value, let's say one. 
Okay, this is my congestion constraint. Of course, it has to be positive, but not negative. But this is I have this constraint that it's not it cannot go above uh, one. Okay, so this is the set of velocity that are now in L two quite naturally, such that the divergence of v is positive. It has to. It may not. It's not authorized to increase the densities, meaning that the divergence is not negative as soon as the density is one. So this is quite informal. Let me put quotes to say that it's not a very uh, proper definition, but it can be, like for the standard DASI problem, it can be defined in a, in a dual way. The set of velocities such that V dot the gradient of Q is less than zero for any Q in H10 of omega. <coughs> Where Q is a pressure, it corresponds to the pressure between individuals, so it has to be non-negative. <coughs> and it's natural if you want to express this constraint in a dual way, it's natural to write it like, like that. And um, you still have the constraint that when the constraint is not violated, well, it's not saturated, when rho is strictly less than one, uh, you should have uh, zero pressure. When people do not touch, there is no interaction. If you do not put that, you might have in your model interaction between people that are far away. It does not make sense. If you, we do not consider here social interaction between people. So you have Q times one minus rho, that has to be zero, meaning that when rho is less than one, no saturation, Q has to be zero, okay? And uh, quite naturally, you end up with a problem if you want to formulate the problem that consists in projecting the desired velocity onto this set, you end up with a unilateral Darcy problem that I'm going to write directly. It's really the same kind of principle. U plus the gradient of P equals U, and you have minus the divergence of U that is less than zero on the saturated zone. And you have the pressure that is positive, non-negative, and you still have this complementary constraint, P uh, times, uh, well, let me write it, U times gradient P equals zero. It basically states that uh, when the divergence of U is strictly positive, uh, then there is no need to have a, a pressure, so the pressure must be zero. It has, be, has to be read like a P divergence of U. Okay, so you have this Darcy problem, and that, let me just give you an example that I will get to the, the illustration I wanted to show you. Um, so there is actually, we spent at least five years to try to analyze. This is a complicated problem, it's not so obvious, but since we still have this non-smooth dependence, and we, we also have the uh, uh, native difficulty of the transpose equation, this is quite tricky. I'm not going to talk about that, but we, let me just say that we, we needed uh, optimal transportation context in order to deal with that. But I will just, uh, just would like to make a remark on the instantaneous problem that we have to solve. So again, if you consider the place where the constraint is saturated, you end up with the Darcy problem, you can eliminate the velocity and you have your Poisson problem that's right like that, minus Laplace of P, that is equals to minus divergence of U. And in the quite common situation, we have this, and I just would like to show you how bad this model is actually in terms of modeling because it does not reproduce an effect that is observed in practice, and you can show that this, it does not reproduce it. So it's quite interesting from the mathematical or academic sense, but as it is, it's not very uh, useful in practice because of the reason I'm going to, to tell you. If you have an evacuation of a room, Imagine that everybody wants to exit this room. There are many people, more than that, so that you can consider it as a continuum. <clears throat> so there are thousands of people. And here you have an exit. 
and you have the desired velocity uh, that is everybody wants to go out as fast as possible. So this is typically a field that concentrates, it has a negative divergence. So this is negative, so with a minus sign, this is positive typically. And it's, uh, you can expect that a jam will, will occur, you will have a saturated zone, so this corresponds, you will have a gray zone with rho strictly less than one, people that are not yet in the jam, you will have people going out, those disappear from the model, they are saved, and here you have a saturated zone where rho equals one. So that's the zone I'm interested in. The natural boundary condition here at uh, the interface between the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone uh, one, is it comes from that, it's basically you will have the pressure equals, because the pressure has to be uh, in H10, it's not exactly continuous, but it's uh, almost continuous, it cannot uh, ever go uh, straight uh, jams through uh, hypersurfaces. So uh, the, the, basically the pressure has to be continuous. So since it has to be zero here, it is zero here. So here I have, sorry, P equals zero. And on the outlet also, if you want to let people go freely, you have P equals to zero. And here you have walls, you have the natural condition is a <coughs> uh, Neumann binary condition, DP over DN equals to zero. So in this situation, uh, you have an equation like that, Poisson problem with this positive right-hand side, uh, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition here. So obviously, the pressure is positive in the saturated zone. So meaning if you come from this to this, it starts at zero, then it increases, and then it decreases. So you can imagine you have a maximal uh, zone where it's maximal. And what is sure is that here is zero and here is positive, so dp over dn is negative, okay? Because it decreases. But the correction, the velocity, u dot n is u dot n minus gradient p dot n. And this is minus dp over dn. So since dp over dn is negative, this is positive. So people at the exit they exit faster than they would if, if there were nobody. So that's obvious with the problem, they are pushed by people inside. That's quite natural if you consider the model. But it's known that in some situation, you have the so-called faster is slower effect, meaning that when people start to push uh, violently, then it reduces the, the speed, it's not work so fine. So the model is not very nice. It always have people go faster, even when there is congestion problem, you have people that the evacuation is easier, that is not conformed to, to practice, and this is obvious here. And what is not obvious is actually that the microscopic model is much more respectful of this effect, because it's not a, a real Laplace operator in particular, it does not verify the maximum principle, that might look like a defect of the model, but it's not actually, it's the richness of the model. The fact that the Laplace operator verifies the maximum principle it is the reason why the model is bad, actually. But, and the fact that the Laplace discrete is bad, uh, it's, it makes the, the model richer and, in particular, able to reproduce this kind of effect. So now, let me try to show you a few... Uh, would it make sense to, to make some viscosity by solving a kind of uh, stove instead of dust? Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, well, uh, here it's, uh, you know, the Darcy, it's quite abstract, it's really, it comes from a projection, uh, or you can add, yeah, you could add uh, viscosity. It, it could make sense, that could be one of the, the possibilities. To put, um, yeah, you have to think about boundary condition, but yeah, uh, that would make sense if you want to account for friction between people or things like that. It might improve this, yeah. Well, what we, so it is that what we realized with the microscopic model is that is uh, the reason why, at least one of the reasons why this faster is slower effect might be uh, effective is that it's because of the microscopic structure of, of grains. It's really a micro macro issue that is not directly related to, to uh, friction. But that, that's an interesting point. He has to try to put some friction. We could try to do that with free fam quite easily, actually. That, uh, okay, do, do I have the... Oh, I have to activate. 
Okay, I uh, already mentioned uh, Juliette Venel, and so also done the, especially the computation are also made with uh, Sylvain Ford, uh, who is here, and the macroscopic uh, uh, model was developed with Audrou Neuf Chupin and Filippo Santambrogio. Let me first show you a, an, a comparison between a microscopic situation and macroscopic in, the, in a similar context. This is the evacuation of a room with five obstacles, and this is the, the, the microscopic evacuation. So what is represent the red? It actually is some kind of uh, uh, pressure. Actually, it's not very uh, respectful of the structure because what we did here, what, that's what we, we did at the beginning, is considered for any, each individual, it, has, it is involved with some contacts. For each contact, there is a pressure, and we add the pressures of those contacts to have a number that corresponds to the, some kind of pressure experienced by one individual, and that gives you the color. Okay, the red corresponds to a high pressure, people that are uh, crushed. And uh, this is the microscopic. This is the first example that works fine to show that actually even if the model has different, I don't know if it's very obvious, but you rarely find something that is similar. Unfortunately, I don't have the... Uh, there is a counterpart of the pressure, of course, the microscopic. That is the pressure that I talked about. And we can compute it, but it's not represented here. But we would find uh, similar, uh, similar things. And uh, you see that in here you have a snapshot comparison showing that actually the density is not so, they are not so, so different. But why I had to cheat for that to change the time between the two because of the effect I told you about is that the, the macroscopic model goes too fast, actually. It's too fluid. Okay, this is the example of the structure. This is a real jam that was computed by Sylvain. It is obtained, I don't know how many, uh, here I have 10, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. there are 15 particles, and um, this is a real uh, jam that can happen. It cannot happen for the macroscopic, for the reason I told you, there is no jam, but in the macroscopic case, because of the bad properties of the, uh, the underlying Laplace operator, you might have jams. So this is the primal graph, and this is the dual uh, graph on which the Laplace discrete Laplace is defined, and this is actually the equilibrium. In black, you have the desired velocity, and in blue, you have the effect of the contact forces between. And you can check, at least it should be the case, if you sum for each particle, you sum all contribution, you get uh, zero. That makes it possible to have such uh, jams. That can be shown to be stable in practice. I mean, if you move a little, then it will, it will get back to its, uh, its configuration. Uh, this is a, an example of pressure fields for the microscopic in, into a similar simu simulation. And here I, I recover what I had in the, what I showed, that is the solution I uh, mentioned before, with a zero pressure, zero pressure, and then a maximal here, and something that is much more complicated here. And, uh, well, basically th that's it. So I, chose, I, I like this, uh, this one just to express the... Yeah. The complexity, this is done, it's not people, uh, but it was done by Sylvain Faure with uh, 300,000 uh, 300, particles, and it, it uh, expresses the, it's actually the pressure field that is represented. This is something, this pressure field in some way, you can see it's the solution to a Poisson equation, but a very bizarre Poisson equation that is associated to this uh, discrete Laplace operator that explains that you, the intuition you have that the solution to Poisson equation should be smooth. In particular, you see that it's not true at all. You have something that is, of course, it's not smooth in, in time, but also in space. You have these lines that go across the domain that reflects the microscopic structure of, of it. And um, I like that also. There is a situation where you can put people, a situation where you, when you have, uh, you see, like in the army, you have uh, people uh, going straight ahead, and you put them uh, against each other. I should show actually the, the microscopic first. It's quite uh, simple. In that case, you have uh, two blocks and the evolution quite smooth. And this is a solution to a Poisson problem that is with a right hand side that is singular because the velocity, desired velocity field is plus one and minus one. And in that case, the divergence of such a field is a measure that is concentrated on the place where you have. Uh, um, plus one and minus one, and uh, this is the, the solution you get. 
but in the microscopic situation, you get this bizarre situation. Here, you have nothing, and then you have uh, instabilities, and uh, this is the, the discrete counterpart of what you saw at the microscopic, macroscopic level. Okay, and, uh, and I will end, sorry for the, I'm already late, I will end up with that, and, uh, and uh, uh, this is an example, I'm just uh, saying you, there are, I don't remember how, perhaps 100 to 200 uh, particles, and here, that is a much more respectful representation of the, of the thing, because the, you have a link when you have a contact, and the color depends on the pressure associated to this contact. So what you see is that it's all, is still very uh, rapidly varying in time and in space. It corresponds to uh, the, the solution of the lambda, actually, that is uh, associated to all these uh, contacts. Okay, and uh, now I'll be able to be uh, happy to answer your question here if you have any. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, did you think about uh, modelized people not as circles but as uh, rectangles, for example? Rectangles because or ellip Yeah, we thought about ellipses. Ellipse, actually, yeah, it's the same right. for grain. Yeah, actually, it's already quite complex in this kind of models. When, especially when, when it uh, handles, it, it's related to human reality. You can put many uh, complexity in your model. The problem that um, the more complexity you put, the, the more difficult it gets to. to to analyze the model, but and it seems that it does make at least qualitatively it does not make set so much a difference. But you are right; it should be more respectful, and it will change a bit the model because then you have an angle and, and you have the so basically ellipse would be nice, and I, I think it's already almost done that we can compute. We could do things. The computation could be done, just a bit more complicated. Because for example, but for this kind of jams, yeah. I think you, uh, you have the rotation effect of people. We yeah. can uh, avoid the jam that you cannot avoid oh. if you are seeing well, you here, circles. Yeah, you are talking about jam avoidance, but uh, here it's not actually. People don't do anything to avoid jam. They just continue to push. Yeah. It's, it seems to be not, not so uh, unrealistic in, in some situation, actually. But uh, you, so there is no strategy, no. But uh, that could be interesting yet if you include strategies to also include angular possibilities that people can. Uh, move around and rotate, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.